All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll get going again. Our next speaker is our first core contributor for today. Isn't it? Yes, yes it is. Uh, Marcus Holterman uh, joined the core team a oh, year and change ago, um, mostly to clean up all the mess with migrations that Andrew had left. Uh, <laughs> he's here today to talk to us about two-factor authentication and integrating it into your Django project. Thank you, Marcus. probably should switch on my microphone. Um, my more regular contribution to Django started in the beginning of 14 and 2014, and then, well, with the upcoming uh, release of Django migrations, or one, Django 1.7, I cleaned up a bunch of things in migrations, opened lots of pull requests, and the core team back then was too lazy to merge them, so they made me do it myself. Um, so in trend, that was 2015 when I eventually became a core developer. In well, these days I work at a, as a senior de developer at a company called LaterPay in Germany, where we do mobile micropayment or micropayment in general, and we try to make it smarter and easier to use for this part that's selling digital goods and the part that's purchasing, and in a way that we try to make it as simple as going out for dinner. You order, you get your food, and when you're done, you pay. About this talk, I need to give you a short disclaimer. This talk is about security and cryptography. I'm not a security or cryptographer, so keep all those please in mind. This is to the best of my knowledge, to the best of the knowledge of people I trust and asked when I was not sure myself. Um, if there's anything in this talk that where you know this is wrong, what I, tell, what I told you here, Please find me afterwards so I can address that before I publish my slides. Let's get a bit in the history of authentication in general. And authentication is to be actually something that we are confronted with every single day. You get up in the morning, most of you or a lot of you probably have the first thing they do is have a look at their phone, at the newsreader or weather or whatnot, and what they have to do, what you have to do before you actually see something is unlock the screen. There you go, you authenticated yourself against your phone that you are actually the person who is able to, or allowed to use the phone. But that's today. What was there before, maybe a decade ago, centuries ago? And interestingly, passwords are fairly old. About 300 BC, the Romans passed so-called watchwords between different parts of their military and, and, and their, their military structures so that certain key people knew which of those parts were, well, not providing any, or not forwarding information to others, and then could deal with that fact. But time evolved and so did passwords, and eventually in 1944, paratroopers from the US had watchwords, or what was then already called a challenge response at the Battle of Normandy. And they had a uh, challenge, which was flash, and were expecting a response thunder. That is also history, but and these are both word-based or language-based in this sense. When you go even further back, in about 700 BC, the Greek and Spartans had a thing called cytel or skytel, which is a cylinder with parchment wound around it, and only if you had the cylinder with a certain diameter here, you could either decrypt the message or when you got the message and wanted to make sure that it's the, the, the owner or the writer of this message is the one who pretended to be, then you had to take the cylinder with a certain diameter, and only if those added up, then everything was fine. So this was kind of another part of authentication where you had something to make sure something matched up. Now, in terms of two-factor authentication, or 2FA as it's um, abbreviated in many places, what is it actually? And well, two-factor authentication is a particular part of multi-factor authentication and somewhat related to 
universal, um, universal two-factor authentication or UTF. And in, generally, in general, it consists of two things. One thing you possess or your user possesses and something a user knows. And looking at our daily life, look at credit cards and the PIN. Only when you have the PIN and the credit card you can actually get money out of these stupid M um, ATMs. You have logins for Google, GitHub, whatnot, and you can only log in when you have your password and some kind of token get generator, for example, on your phone. If you don't have your phone, well, you're out of luck, you can't log in unless you have access to backup keys, which is also something you possess. You possess a copy or print out probably of those static keys. But there's also different things that are not necessarily IT related. Think about fingerprints. They are pretty much unique to everybody. About the iris of your eyes or the voice. To be fair enough, the voice, there are computer programs these days that manage to simulate voices of other people. So I wouldn't rely on voice recognition or voice identification probably. But it's still more advanced than, for example, SMS, which is a common thing used by banks, at least back in, over in Germany. But looking at the NIST, the, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, you should not use SMS or any kind of this out-of-band authentication in that area. And they recently released um, or published a draft on digital authentication guidelines in which it has, says, due to the risk of SMS messages may be intercepted or redirected, implementers of new systems should carefully consider alternative authentications. <clears throat> well, yes, do not use SMS if you even think about doing two-factor authentication. There are other features I mentioned before. And I'm going, go, going to go into details in the rest of the talk. Make sure you follow um, common standards in terms of what you should do, not what everybody is doing. And what they are saying is essentially, do not use SMS, yes. Now for today and for this talk and today as in the current time we are living in, what is out there and what should you probably be using? And let's start with the basis of probably the most two most commonly used authentication or two-factor authentication um, algorithms. One is HOTP, which stands for HMAC-based one-time passwords. And it's not really magic what's happening there. It's uh, HMAC SHA-1. SHA-1 itself is not secure anymore, but in combination with, with HMAC, this, the insecurities of SHA-1 are not there. And what HMAC does, they take a counter, a key, and do a bit of cryptography and a bit of bit shifting, byte shifting, um, truncation, and this is what your six digit pin is you get from your whatever Google Authenticator app on your phone, for example. And when you wanna look at the code, this is what the Django OTP package does. It's a bit reformatted, but this is all you need to have and code to get a HOTP token based on a key and a counter. Now, HOTP is, while it works, it's also kind of a mess when you accidentally press the button for get, please get me a new token because then server and client are suddenly out of sync. So somebody came up with a smart idea, which is TOTP. And this is no magic at all either. It is based on HOTP and instead of taking a counter as in one, two, three going up, it takes the count time, which is why it's called time-based one-time pass. And taking the count time is kind of a bit annoying when you need to only have like a second or so to enter uh, the number because this is probably not gonna work. So smart people came up when writing the RFC to let's take a certain time span, T0 to T, divide that by, by a certain time span, and let's take this, this is a counter. Time only moving forward, this is a perfectly valid counter. It's not continuous, but that doesn't really matter. The gotcha here is that you make, only need to make sure that 
you, when you validated a token, you need to make sure that you are not going to use the token that has been used before. So only always store or always remember the last time you had a valid token and you'll be fine. So expressing this in code, Python time, Python's time dot time returns floats, so you need to be, do a bit of um, casting to integers, uh, then the uh, integer division there, and then you call, call HTTP with what you have there as a counter and a key. These are software implementations. There are things like YubiKey and NitroKey, which is a low brand YubiKey from, from Germany. So I think YubiKey, uh, YubiKey is based in the US. Um, so if you're scared of NSA or things, then you might want to go for something else. Not that this probably matter, but well, maybe. These are hardware-based implementations of one-time pads. Um, in various forms of, and, and, and features, some of them just provide you with one-time pads. Some of them do encrypted storage as an, on an attached USB stick. And look at their products or product maps and yeah, figure out what, if and what you want to use there. I don't have one, I'm not sure if I want to have one in the up in the upcoming future, but yeah. Now, given these basics about one-time pads or two-factor authentication, how do we actually get this into Django? Because that's DjangoCon, and we want to have this in Django, because that's also the title of the talk. Um, the next five slides are going to be a bunch of source code. I, got, I will dump that on you. You don't need to understand all of that, like looking at it and understand what it's doing. Going to go through the important parts, bits and pieces. I will point out a couple of things that are gotchas. These slides will be online later. You can have a look there when you want to, you don't need to take, necessarily take pictures of all the slides. Um, yeah. What I'm going to do is implement a TOTP device because that's what you're probably going to use these days and then have a, a validator or decorator for a view that makes sure only if when you provided a valid TOTP token, you can actually access the view. Let's start off with the model. So we need to have a key. We need to have the, um, the, this device assigned to a user. And we, as said before, we want to store the last time it was used as well as the first, when this, this, this counter should start and how long one of those intervals should be. We also have this verified token thing that makes sure that the last time or the current time met is greater than last time it was used and that, well, both tokens actually add up. And then, well, you want to update the current instance and return true or false. The form or the, the view we eventually use for validating a token will use a form because it's in user input and when you have user input, you use forms. It's a pretty simple form, it takes one field, an integer that's, well, validates if the token adds up to what the should be on the, for the user, then you're all set. This is the view. It checks if you have a, if, if the current session is verified, which is a key I defined, you can up, come up there with whatever you want. If the current session is verified, which means the user had provided a valid TOTP token, then well, let's redirect to wherever, the, wherever you want. So you, this is like a really basic implementation. So we redirect to the, um, log, the view after a login. The rest of the, of the review is plain post views, function based post, view, uh, post request views in Django. You construct the form, if it's valid, you do things. If not, you return the form to the template. Or if it's not a post request, you create a form. Now comes the interesting part. The decorators or mixings you can put on your views. When you check for an, is, if the user is authenticated, you redirect to the login URL. Or if, uh, sorry, if the user is not authenticated, you don't even have a user instance that has an assigned well, you have an anonymous user, but that doesn't have a 
token or a TOTP device. So let's make sure the user actually logs in first. If the user is logged in and is uh, verified, then let's just process the view. If not, redirect to the view where we provide the token. And the pretty much the same code you have up here, you have in the, in the mixing here. Gotcha, this is a Django 1.10 example. You don't have necessarily have the function calls here anymore. This was something in one, we changed in 1.10. These are, is authenticated and is anonymous are now properties. Well, and this is how you actually implement it or use these decorators. You have your view that returns something or you have an, either a function-based view or a, a class-based view. Now, this is a lot of boilerplate. And while this works and you might be able to use the admin to create a key and then set it up generally, this is probably not everything you wanna have. There are a couple of things you want to have to automate the process for users that want to use two-factor authentication. You don't have a nice key setup, and that includes a thing where you t use your phone, you scan, a, for example, a QR code to then have this in, for example, Google Authenticator. You don't have, back have backups codes, which means that, oh, I lost my phone, hmm, I can't log in because I don't have a, any way to authenticate me myself with a second token. And you certainly don't have any Django admin integration yet. And imagine to write this every single time you start a new project where you have requirements or you wanna, where you wanna make sure that you integrate two-factor authentication. This is something that's not going to be too pleasant. And well, there have been people out there who started, or who, who thought of that before and came up with projects. One of them I've already mentioned is Django OTP, which does all the cryptographic and fundamental underlying magic, so to say. So it does provide an TOTP device. It provides you with an HOTP device. It provides you with service for YubiKey and I think there's a Twilio um, integration for SMS. And there's plenty of other things that you can just use because it's there. That's fine. It has a Django admin integration, which is very basic from my perspective. And from, for projects where I would want to use TOTP or two-factor authentication in general, I probably would not rely on this Django admin integration because it does not cover enough things I want to have in, when I use a Django admin in production. So there's another project which I started co-maintaining a couple of weeks ago, which is called Django two-factor auth. Um, it heavily reuses Django OTP, so it uses the underlying models and the underlying cryptography implementation. Um, it currently does have a more advanced Django admin integration, as it's, it does a bit of more magic to make things work. There's a key setup, entire key setup process included, including QR code view and all kinds of fancy things phone validation, SMS validation, all these things you don't want to do yourself. It's there, you can just use that. The admin integration while being there is still a bit limited. And I know that a lot of people actually use the Django admin out there for their production development or production sites, which is, I guess, I think it's fine if you don't use it, abuse it for too many things. So we do use it at work as well, and I'm currently starting and in introducing or trying to look into what we need to have to do to get two-factor authentication in our projects. And well, I started writing on an advanced Django admin integration, and well, the login view, well, after you're logged into the admin, you're prepare, uh, presented with a, well, you need two-factor to log into the admin. So let's get started and do this and activate this. And while you go through the process, you get your QR code. Feel free to scan that if you want. This is a local development system. This key is not nowhere else. 
Um, you enter the key and, well, voila, there you are. You set up two-factor authentication. Well, now you, as mentioned before, you probably want to have backup codes. Great. Let's create them. And voila, you're in the Django admin. And when you make sh made sure that you installed everything in the right order, you even get a let's go to my Django to, or my two-factor authentication settings. What do you need to do to actually get this working? First of all, you need to check out a development branch or pull request I'm currently writing at. And then you add like a bit of Django OTP and two-factor to your installed apps. You get, have a middleware which does some caching on the is verified things to not create the database too often. And you can optionally force two-factor for the admin or you can set it in a way that if you have two-factor authentication set up for your account, you have to provide it. If you don't, well, I let you in without. I'm not sure if this is a good idea, but it's what's there. Um, and you need to include one URL into your URL patterns to make sure this QR code stuff works. And that's about it. Looking at the boilerplate we had before, looking at this, this is much more what I prefer as somebody who just wants to use two-factor. Now, let's get into a, head, a bit ahead of ourselves or leaving the conference what you can do once you get back home or get to back, back to work. In my opinion, when you deal with something with sensitive personal information in your projects, you probably want two-factor authentication. And when you deal with other people's money, you probably want two-factor authentication as well. When you deal with sensitive infrastructure, so for example, Amazon, and you are one of those people who has access to all the things, you probably want two-factor authentication for these accounts as well. When you deal with anything that you think might be worth it, sure, why not act, uh, enable to or implement two-factor authentication? There's no harm in doing so. When you deal with anything else, why not still provide users the option to have two-factor authentication if, it's, if they think it's worth their security? And, well, how you get there is a bit of your choice. If you feel like writing the, the stuff yourself, there's a Python OTP or HOTP implementation out there which does the underlying crypto implementation, pretty much th this one function I so showed earlier. If you feel like, okay, I'm gonna use something like that does all the things, sure, use, one, use things like that. It literally uh, depends on what you prefer to use. And I wanna close with an article by Kenneth Rees from a day or two ago, where he laid out how two-factor authentication saved, a couple of, uh, saved him, his GitHub account from being hacked. And it's a really good read, and if you work on a, if you have a GitHub account, probably want to activate two-factor authentication if you work for a company that uses GitHub. If maybe even make the company to enforce two-factor authentication. It's not going to harm you, it's going to make sure that somebody who guesses or who cracked your password because <coughs> of whatever reason, social engineering or, or whatnot, manages to get into your account. Sure, that sucks, but when you have two-factor authentication, they still have to provide this one thing they don't have. Hopefully, they don't got your phone. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Marcus. Again, if you've got any questions, please come up and form a line. Um, just getting started, the, uh, this, the, a lot of this stuff was based around having a YubiKey or a, um, I can't remember the other one you mentioned. Um, Nitro key, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and SMS is obviously not being recommended at the moment. Yeah. We're sort of in this interesting space where everyone has a phone, but it's a bad option, and very few people have a YubiKey, so. It's not the, the, so it's not the, SM, it's not the phone being a bad, bad idea. The out of band authentic um, out of band communication with your phone and the server, because the mobile phone network is generally insecure, SMS. or well SMS is in insecure. So when I I can go back to the slides and I have the full quote quote here. 
Um, where is it? Um, so, due to the risk that SMS messages may be intercepted or redirected, implementers of new systems should carefully consider alternative authenticators. If the out-of-band verification is to be made using an SMS message on a public mobile phone network, the verifier shall verify that pre-registered telephone numbers being used is actually associated with a mobile phone network. As in you can with faked um, Zims, or that's beyond my uh, level of experience, but you can apparently like fake your mobile, fake a mobile phone device, which then would get the SMS f earlier than the other one. Then you can. Yeah. Sure. Is that something that's likely to be safer if it was handled as a push notification on an app or something like that? Or I guess I'm Possibly, not sure, but, but maybe. okay. Um, there was a question. Was that generally, if you want, if you th no, if you think about implement or uh, integrating two-factor authentication, or you want to read more about generally authentication principles, read this damn draft. This is I, I skimmed it and it was good, and then I finally I eventually read it entirely and was wow, this is great. Yeah. Generally, in terms of what and how to do authentication or how to not do it. Okay. If there are any other questions, no. All right. Well, thank you very much, Marcus.